Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is uh, host Chaopong Shen from Penn State University. This one is the one last presentation on the, uh, the Quasi 2019 Spring Cyber Seminar Series on recent advances in big data machine learning and hydrology. Today, we're, we're pleased to have Dr. Xu and uh, Colin Xu from UC University of California, Irvine, and uh, two of the students as well. The topic is on remote sensing precipitation, uh, precipitation forecast. And uh, Dr. Xu and uh, the, the group at UC Irvine have been working on machine learning for a long time, and they their papers on using machine learning, uh, especially deep learning, to uh, forecast precipitation was first published, I think, noticed, uh, noticed in 2016. So they are definitely one of the earliest players in this field. And they recently, uh, I think many of this uh, stuff that you see today have been published in water resources research or uh, journal of hydrometeorology or other or other journals. So without much further ado, I give the mic to Dr. Xu. Dr. Xu, you're okay. on. You're on. <clears throat> So I'm on. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, thank you, Xiaopang, um, for your introduction about our activities. Um, uh, today is an honor and also my uh, pleasure to give this uh, presentation uh, on the topic, which is a re uh, remote sensing precipitation using machine learning methods. Um, as uh, uh, Dr. Xiaopang, uh mentioned about we've been working on this field for a period of time so we i pretty much want to give you uh what we did uh, over the history for a very quick review and then go into the uh, remote sensing precipitation and in the same time uh two of my students uh will join us uh bao xiang pan and the ata sajian and They've been working on the uh, deep learning uh, application for precipitation for casting for the short term and also to the uh, to the now casting portions. So that at the end um, they're gonna give like 10 minutes for each one to give the idea of what we are doing over the uh, uh, LSTM and DNN application for precipitation for casting. So uh, we start. Uh, okay, that here is the content uh, I want to. Uh, show everybody. Uh, we start actually right around a modeling using machine learning like a, a neural network. So I give you a little bit what we did before, and then switch channel to uh, the precipitation estimation from remote sensing information. <laughs> um, now later, um, Ata will talk about one to six hour now casting um, using the LSTM, and finally Bao Xiang will talk about. Uh, uh, CNN uh, convolution neural network uh, for the uh, uh, short-term forecasting and actually is a uh, include the numerical model uh, where the model and the CN together for improve the, the uh, forecasting for a couple of days so give a quick summary at the end so actually we work on the deep learning actually uh, at the last time it's back in time to uh, 90s and um, that it was the time that the neural network start to recover from the last episode for you know stopping uh that kind of uh, uh application because of x o r problems and minsky and Perth. in eighties uh, it's becoming a very exciting time period and ninety we start to work on hey how that can be used for hydrological applications um we start with the rainbow run of modeling. And of course, there are very interesting activities there, but also challenges later when we move on uh, those, uh, you know, uh, uh, neural network into application to remote sensing because of a very limited uh, uh, computation powers we have. So that it's not, we know the power for the neural network, but it cannot be so much extended to uh, like a new nowadays, like a deep learning network, that kind of approach. So I will give you some, you know, what we did uh, in the early days uh, with the new network uh, right now for the uh, rainfall run of modeling side. So the concept, the concept is so we have the rainfall, and the, through the model, which can be physical based or actually system model, or uh, in in a linear, nonlinear 
uh, nonlinear like the neural network model for stream flow for casting. And the system can be lambda or distributed like the catchment with the forcing that from the um, as a uh, basin average rainfall or uh, the 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 uh, area uh, specific rainfall estimate. And lamb is quite straightforward for like you can use a time delay and uh, uh, for this case it's a three layer new neural network and uh, with the uh, time delay forcing and then even so with the uh, the feedback from the uh, stream flow as uh, the input to the forecasting. And this is uh, one of the, you know, quite uh, uh, much used uh, uh, network. Uh, and then, of course, uh, here you need to check for what is time lag and uh, also time delay information from the stream flow for the fitting uh, and then also training. But uh, moving from here, then there's another structure which is recurrent type of network. Now, basically, you just need to consider the basin, you know, like an average rainfall coming in, and then with the setting for, in this case, like a three hidden nodes, uh, and with dynamic uh, feedback, and then to the queue, which is uh, your forecast. So in in that, actually, recurrent network has a much simpler, cleaner structure that include those uh, dynamic uh, uh, of the fitting uh, to to the uh, stream flow forecasting. So it's a kind of in the early days we explored, and that was the uh, nineties, uh, um, ninety seven, ninety six. We work on those the kind of concept and with the recurrent network structure. And you can see this is a three a nine input three hidden nodes and one output and then this one is recurrent for the precipitation and three hidden and then then they, they simulate the nicely for you know for the stream flow for casting in that case but now when we move from uh, lamp to distributed which the precipitation can be distributed all the process can be distributed then it becomes a very complicated for just say precipitation alone then you have to include like a patient uh, sub area uh, you know average rainfall to there then from the from the uh feed forward the network becomes very complicated with a lot of inputs everywhere but then of course the advantage from the uh, recurrent network would be that you can have the you know different parts fitting in for the precipitation with the dynamic itself. So we explore the idea over the uh, 90s, uh, uh, over that kind of recurrent network structure. Of course, uh, these days, uh, we all use, uh, instead of recurrent network, use the LSTM kind of concept to maybe the dynamic process, which uh, can actually advance a lot of training issue uh, from, from this kind of system. So, in theory, they are all doing well. Um, in multi-layer people, well recurrent. They can fit well for uh, according to common growth uh, theories that you know it's a, a function approximate if the, the system is uh, being complete. But the structure and the training uh, is difficult. At that time, the computational facility is also very limited. Now, now this states that. It's also multiple threads uh, to the nodes of HPC and the GPU. And so that basically we can only explore the limited structure. And um, it's been talking about it's a black system, black box. So uh, it's kind of uh, we can fit the function well, but sometimes we don't understand that. So that later we propose another kind of mapping type of network, which is called step organizing each man with linear output. In that, we put one side for the classification of input feature, and the other side is the uh, mapping. But instead of nonlinear mapping, you put into the linear for each part of the classification, which means that we have a nonlinear process, which is mapped by the piecewise linear to create the nonlinear. And the good thing from this system is because of this part is classification, which can be used as a as a the classified uh, um, limited data for the training, and then we can find uh, all of the data over the uh, mapping here, which this part is linear, so that we can stop the, the equation in uh, one step of the uh, uh, this square uh, 
you know, kind of solution. So that it's not such a so-called training issue because this is a linear regression can find out the solution as the data come in and for training without problem. So, so that kind of concept like we had to divide into the different sub regions as the same organizing feature, map each part as a linear system so that they put together for, for a lot of linear system with uh, fitting into the nonlinear dimensions, the space here. So, and, and the same organizing feature may is one of the neural network system that's been uh, popular over the time. So this is one example. If say we only have four groups on the same organizing future map, then the classification will give you four uh, linear system, which one side is fitting nicely over the low flow, the other one is rising lean, and then the other part of the group will be over the recession part and the transition part has another group. So that it actually puts the simulation nicely over the whole hydrograph. Um, and this is a 15 by 15 kind of self-organizing feature map. Actually, after sorting, the training result give you the region moving along, and you can see the trigger, the uh, forcing uh, moving along the dimension and like a circle, that kind of, but of course, different places. And the different region represent the properties of hydro, hy hy hydrographs. So like here is very uh, low, no rain, Space flow and then get into start to rain and the land to the to the middle and the, to the peak and then go into the recession and come into the low level and come back to the uh, low flow again. So it's coming to like a information which you can see the region and uh, also classification. So getting into the feeling of what happens to the, those classification and the the mapping information that you can describe the, the system the, and the, its progress. It, in addition, that the data actually fit into all the, the nodes and be used to de define the, the linear system and the layer arrows can come back into the uncertainties of the estimates uh, quite straightforward so that you can build up the, the hydrograph with their uncertainty and then also distributions uh, over your simulation. So um, this is one of the parts we work on the regular round of process uh, up to the using the solo. The good thing for that is the linear, of course, but piecewise to the nonlinear process and the then uh, network construction training quite simple. It's two stages training and the uh, IO structures um, can be actually understand better because of the mapping and rules and the classification and also uh, quite easy we can deal with the confidence bonds for the predictions. So and um, then when we move on, uh, this okay here is another one uh, showing you the multi-layer people war and the land recurrence and solo and um, use a uh, uh, linear uh, MRX and conceptual supplemental models uh, for the simulation. They are all doing pretty good. And the uh, solo actually is been doing pretty good job over the calibration and validation period because of a lot of um, the linear system fit into the soil structure. And here they are all com compatible and quite comfortable in general for to the system uh, simulation overall. And I want to switch to precipitation estimation right now. So there's a kind of motivations to my study over years. Uh, we've been working on the rainfall realm of classes. Um, then to a point that we, I, I realized that a lot of things actually to the process uh, which input is not being done accurately, then the uncertainty to the output is very high. So that uh, looking into say maybe we can use the neural network um, for you know, precipitation study. And so, so in that, uh, I started to embark into uh, precipitation and, and, you know, with the motivation that uh, we can deal with uh, operational hydrology, especially to the extreme events for like flooding and input from the forcing is important. And long term perspective of that, uh, you know, like a drought or others, uh, you know, the or water supply precipitation is also important too. So 
So we work on that and different observations, they have their advantages and also their limitations. Uh, for example, from radar point of view, that over the mountain and regions and a lot of blockages, uh, depends on which level of the height you are looking at. Over the west side, this is two kilometer above the ground level from radar coverage. And one kilometer would be much lower. And gauge distribution is great, but over the same to the mountain regions or even in Colorado River, um, they have also very limited in certain way samples. And extending from uh, US to the other region of the world is even uh, worse than um, comparing to, you know, United States. So satellite that has the advantages for uh, for as a spatial and temporal coverage for the uh, precipitation sensing. But geostationary satellite is pretty much like every 30 minutes. Um, um, and from the uh, lower orbit satellite, it comes back from time to time. But of course, they do have different type of sensor package. At the last time, I want to look at the, uh, you know, very short time for flooding, uh, we, we cannot be uh, waiting for like, you know, two samples per day uh, at that time from low orbiters um, or polar orbit satellite. So like, we start with the uh, geostation satellite and sensors and try to have a more close uh, monitoring of precipitation in a very short time. And radar sensor from GPM same are uh, outstanding. Um, and those are all very limited sample, but actually they are all supported information. So the concept is we have so much information all everywhere from satellites and even from models and from ground observations, even some sensor of different type to the land surface property. How can we really put them together to say improve our precipitation estimation or forecasting? Later, that uh, Ata and uh, Bao Xiang is to talk about. So it pretty much build up the function type. For example, from our perspective, uh, geostation satellite different channels, and there are some kind of uh, land surface features uh, or you know atmospheric feature with some kind of mapping, either static or dynamic, that we can uh, we can retrieve the rainfall, and then uh, <clears throat> the other kind of information available which we can use either from radar or from the other office satellites uh, can be used for the training of this function and and this function usually is being uh, used uh, like you know the data fitting or, or physical structure for uh, like the radioactive process uh, or the rainfall and the geostation or, or low orbit satellite the property so this function in our case, of course, the data mining community will consider, you know, neural network uh, for for us the function mapping tool. And recently, the development from the uh, NASA Global Precipitation Measurement Mission that actually uh, uh, integrate a lot of information together from uh, from from the geostationary and the from you know polar orbit and satellite information and even providing the applications to other different kind of fields uh, like uh, data uh, simulation and, and approaches. So, so this is uh, the concept for the GPM, which uh, is uh, to use a lot of polar orbiting satellite with microwave sensors and with the objectives of every like three hours uh, or so uh, to have one sample and cover the group, of course, uh, uh, to high mid high latitude region has a lot more coverage, but to the uh, low uh, latitude or or so that the sample still uh, not not necessary as three hours. But basically, that enhances the observations of precipitation in the global scale. So so we've been uh, involved with the team of GPM. And to develop the algorithm called the iMERGE, which is integrations of three uh, groups from UC Irvine and uh, GADA, and also from NOAA. And NOAA has the morphine algorithm, GADA has the uh, PES microwave sensor estimates, and GPROD, and 
then we have the geostationary satellite information from the short time scale and they have more you know three hour and morphine process so that it's becoming to the different weighting factors uh, based on their uncertainty and pack up the, the whole final product together and this product is called the emerge product and and this is product being widely used by community and um, this is the one they built for you know the global coverages and the, the products uh, been evolving over time and our position is uh, uh, working with them as a complementary to their estimates and put together to the global estimates and uh, the product it will provide like early uh, hour uh, for uh, for 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 the latency like early is about four hours and the late would be like 12 hours and the final would be with gauge information that uh, probably one to two months uh, uh, after observation and um, take a look at the concept like the gpm is three hours that kind of uh, samples uh, and assuming we do have high etograph uh, over here that within three hours with morphine that get into the linear smoothing over different uh, time period but if we have a cross look then they are kind of potentially the linear interpolation might overestimate or miss the peak or sometimes the short life events which uh, cannot be covered nicely so that in that uh, the short time uh, estimation followed for the activity is important so we develop uh, the, the short-term approaches um, with the geostationary satellites um, this area we've been continued development uh, over our group and let's take a look at the concept <coughs> so we look at the cloud as a system and then they have uh, like convectible cloud and uh, uh, like a uh, cold cloud serious cloud that actually give the different type of precipitation properties um convective cloud give heavy rain and then serious is very cold but pretty much in like a no rain so so from that uh, the cloud if we can find uh, some property over the clouds uh, with identification and mapping then of course uh, well, that has some kind of advantage for the estimation so the the early days we start with like uh, local pixel based mapping which we use the pixel and neighborhood uh, information uh, for the mapping include like a uh, central pixel and neighborhood uh, uh, statistical property and how that is mapping into the rainfall. So in that, uh, it's very minim minimal information for about the cloud. But then cloud actually come up with uh, like a system with uh, a coverage, especially convective cloud has very significant uh, structure. Um, you know, like uh, overshooting top and the uh, high gradient over the structure. So if we can use a called so-called object-based approach, which we can uh, separate the cloud into different uh, groups, then we can provide the uh, you know rainfall estimation in the most significant way. So the the conceptual development is if we have cloud and they can be low to high cloud, and then of course we can do segmentation of the cloud and the land uh, from from the cloud into the different pages then they have different properties which we can uh, we can extract of the different temperature level and if this is a warm cloud then it, and it actually don't show up features to the to the temperature threshold of the different threshold if this is very really cold cloud then it will show up the different stress holes there and then the feature also extracted from those uh, you know cloud pages uh, of uh, interest in a different stress hole so that you know those can be now into the different cloud groups in terms of classifications and then of course follow the this group of objects and then we do have fine scale of pixel information which we can map into the rainfall map so that basically is how it works so, so that warm cloud actually would be a different cloud group and then cold cloud and for the convective uh, stress form actually they have a distinct different features uh, 
that uh, like uh, you know a competitive crowd has more tight gradients and stress bone is more flat so that they are in a different category in that uh, we can map into the red bone map um, with the training from either from radar image or from the other satellite uh, low orbiters or even for like a GPM radar so that we can actually train the mapping from object base into the pixel base uh, for the approaches so, so this is one example to show if you only take a look at pixel alone then the temperature rainbow relationship is somewhere like this because very cold pixel might have no rain to a very high rain um, <clears throat> depends on where what the situation of the uh, of the pixel <clears throat> and if you want to fit a curve like this it's almost impossible because uh, high density over here the, the curve could be very flat and um, one used to be that you have linear nonlinear or step functions to fit that and statistically it's working all right but uh, then in the fine scale estimation that there are always challenges to that so but in these models then we actually with this providing like a, a numbers of groups and the, for the for the warm cloud then there will be a warm fitting group and the then cold cloud they have all, uh, another group to that so that basically the sample has been fitted by like in this case 400 curves and depends on the pixel associated to the cloud information to that. So, um, so you, we got to go over those kind of very fine, interesting approach at the time of development, like uh, segmentation, feature extraction, um, page classification to rainfall estimation. So, for example, we use a watershed algorithm to to find out the coded and the land to start to erode and find out the, what the separate the cloud, you know, in their coverages. So that in that as a as a, the next step of which will be the feature extraction. So that after segmentation, then we can pull out the features from the different level 220, 235, 253. Um, and in that uh, this cloud, for example, very cold. Um, basically all the feature will show up but this one is warmer and then it's only partial feature will show up um, and the, of course uh, the next stage is classification so that this type of cloud is a heavy convective and would be in a in a specific category and this warm can be also convective cloud and it will be in a different uh, categories so so in that uh, we start to fit with uh, those uh, features uh, for the object into the training and then this is someone like to show hey what the cloud looks like over the uh, classification in case of like uh, you know 20 by 20 of the same organizing feature map and then with that uh, then we're training with the ground observations which each part has the distribution curves for the temperature rainfall uh, rate to cover the issue of the cloud group. So in that we start to operate after training and uh, start to train to globally uh, using pet microwave rainfall and let's uh, get into the operation. So that uh, this is our web page um, <clears throat> to provide the, the data set which is a very really short time latency. Um, here is a, uh, usually it's just one hour in general for the time latency for the retrieval. Um, and this is one event to show the over the uh, tropical storm Harvey. Um, basically, you can select that here is the uh, different time accumulation, and also we have the radar image to show, and then you can uh, with the gauge information to show over the web page. And then you can also select the select the different kind of time coverage like so three hours to seventy two hours on the event which is happening. Okay. And then you can run into to select um, you know the the location with gauge and the same, you know, comparison for the different source information or even uh, to select, uh, say, the 
uh, watershed, then you can click it to show the watershed distribution over the past 72 hours from this is Satana and the radar and some reports to the detail of uh, information over the time. So this is provided in our web page. Um, and this another team, uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Hu Yuan is working on how the visualization providing to the users uh, to look at. And it's been a kind of popular website. People are looking to like this is uh, by clicking some heavy rainbow part that immediately you can show the distributions for that. And uh, this is the kind of user to our product, which is uh, quite popular uh, all over the uh, places that uh, this is like the, the white spot means uh, past the 24 hours that the users to uh, to access to our data. And uh, it's quite in general to the global coverage. So very quickly, I'm gonna talk about uh, the some improvements ongoing and uh, also extending from like the more traditional approaches to the recent developments from the deep learning network with the uh, LSTM and the uh, CNN that my student will talk about that. Um, which in that system, um, we only have a threshold reach to 253, that kind of temperatures, so that some kind of warm cloud is still providing rain but we not really effective recovery so that we extend more to to the warmer temperature stress hole that can cover in the warm cloud into classification. This one example to show is the cloud temperature and the radar rainfall correspondence. And to this area with uh, the original 253 that actually has uh, good detections and of course needs a lot of rain too. And then if the threshold start to increase to 260, 280, then certain portion actually, this more warm part uh, um, over Arizona and the uh, radar show some uh, rain over here originally because it's warm, so it won't cover, but uh, the temperature threshold increased to 280 in the training and then the warm rain part can be uh, recovered. So we also work on the, uh, that's what uh, you mean how it's working on with the CNN, uh, Deep Learning Network. And in this case, uh, yes, the two stages um, type of classification from the first stage with one Deep Learning Network for uh, rain or rain detection. And then the second stage will be uh, estimation if the pixel is identified with the RAN, which is another uh, another uh, network for the uh, for the estimation. So it's put put it into two stages of detection and running and you know, approach. And the result looks the more stable. For example, this is a comparison to what we uh, operational uh, model for the retrieval, and this is with the stage two-stage model under the coverage for about three months and uh, over the uh, uh, 15 by uh, about 20 uh, degree coverage that over the summertime the uncertainty error comparing to the ground observation this is original and uh, which has much higher domain square uh, uh, mean square error so, and then this is uh, the two-stage training results uh, which overall uncertainty reduced. So it's already published papers uh, from Yu Min Tao. Then the next part um, that I will give it to Atar to give the presentation for the short time precipitation now testing using uh, LSTM. So let's move to Atar. Sure. Okay. Uh -huh. Hi everyone and thank you Dr. Shu. Uh, my name is Atta. I'm a PhD student of Dr. Shu working on precipitation now, ca now casting using LSTM algorithm. And initially, the motive uh, behind this study was we had a global scale data uh, which was continuous and was governed by the transfer heat law, the uh, infrared images that Dr. Shu mentioned. 
and in general precipitation information is very in, informative and important but in particular uh, more important information would be having precipitation data for the coming hours and that's what we were aiming to uh, and precipitation forecast can provide a range of information and as you can see from short range to long range there are different type of information that we can use but for the uh, study that I did I focused on the short range which is one zero to six hours or now casting we refer as uh, which provides information for flood forecasting, flash flood guidance, uh, portionally head water guidance and flood forecasting. And these are uh, good for human safety, financial loss prevention, and also a uh, aviation safety as well. And uh, going over literature in general, there are two type of ap approaches that uh, people try to address this problem with. The first one is numerical prediction models, which try to uh, do the forecasting using the physical uh, methods. And the second one is the extrapolation methods, which uh, tries to extrapolate the uh, already observed uh, images or data points uh, to the future by statistical models and uh, image processing model. And the method that we used here is the artificial intelligence, which is from the second category extrapolation based model. And to give you an idea of how these two uh, general models work, the uh, green dashed uh, line is the numerical weather prediction model and the forecasting skill for that is okay at the beginning hours of the forecast but it uh, tends to maintain the uh, forecasting skills for a longer range of time and the blue dotted line is the extrapolation based model which for the first few hours of the forecast it has good uh, skills but rapidly decays over the forecast feed time and what we intend is to uh, shift this blue dotted line to the uh, solid uh, black line, which is the theoretical limit. And to do so, we try to uh, look into the recurrent neural networks. And as first initial approach, uh, we investigated the Elman type recurrent neural network, which Dr. Shu already mentioned. Uh, in theory, recurrent neural networks and this type of uh, recurrent neural network is solid, but in practice, we cannot uh, gain much of a performance out of them because of the problems that are already defined with the uh, recurrent neural networks and deep neural networks, the vanishing and exploding gradients which makes it less useful for our purposes. But a recent approach that was developed and it was an update over recurrent neural networks termed as long short-term memory or LSTM. And they tried to solve it by, uh, by gating the information and using control gates to efficiently flow the information and create a memory cell and frequently update that. And the way that they do is trying to mimic the cognitive components of a uh, brain. For example, we need attention to uh, focus on something that we are trying to track, then input gate and also network gates are responsible for that and their combinations of try to bring more attention to the uh, important object. And also, we, after a time, we need to forget some useless information. So forget gate is responsible for that. And the combination of these gates will provide uh, efficiently updated memory cell. 
And from there, we can do our forecast and obtain accurate uh, forecast results. So as a case study, uh, we tried to investigate three different states over the CONUS, which were uh, state of Oregon, Oklahoma, and Florida, uh, to investigate uh, the performance of our model under different precipitation regimes. And for the sake of uh, time and the presentation, uh, I'm only going over the results for state of Oregon. And just a quick overview, Dr. Shu already mentioned about the data, but the data that we have over the CONUS and uh, even over the globe is the GO satellite infrared uh, imagery, uh, which are available every 30 minutes, now with new generation, even uh, with higher temporal resolution. And also spatial resolution is 25 kilometers, again, with the newer uh, generation, we have uh, higher spatial resolution as well. And also for our validation, we use uh, Q2 radar data information. And the way that our network works, we have inputs at time T. We have a uh, recurrent neural network as baseline. We have LSTM and we have a three, we put them into a three layer uh, neural network and we obtain the next time step uh, infrared forecast and from there this infrared forecast uh, will simultaneously uh, be fed into Persian algorithm that we already have and it's an operational and well-known uh, algorithm to obtain the rainfall forecast and also uh, there is a internal back loop that will update the input and by that we will iterate uh, over the forecasting time and from half an hour we will go forward to six hours of forecast and as you can see here we update the input we do the forecast again we uh, get the next time a step forecast and uh, get the precipitation corresponding for that and here is uh, a result example. Uh, here, the two first row uh, belong to the persistency method, which assumes that nothing changes from the last observation. The second two rows are for the LSTM, our proposed model. The third uh, two rows are for recurrent neural network, the baseline. And then we use Farney back optical flow method, which is a very uh, well-known method for the forecasting and at the end two row we have the observation for the infrared and also rain corresponding rainfall values from radar and as you can see here in the uh, circles that we have the red circles and green circles and if you compare the LSTM with the observation uh, the LSTM tends to uh, have more consistency with radar observation in terms of the shape of the rainfall and in the intensity and the evolution uh, follows the observation closely. And uh, some statistics to, uh, as a consent for that, uh, we can uh, see that the first row is the uh, infrared forecast and the red line is our proposed model and it shows relatively low RMSE and high correlation and the precipitation forecast in general are uh, showing that LSTM model with combination of Persian shows higher performances and uh, from there for the uh, future work what we can propose is uh, having a more complicated and more comprehensive uh, model bringing convolution, LSTM and deconvolution as in a uh, united framework uh, for the forecast and then benefit from the Persian algorithm to get the uh, accurate rainfall forecast. And uh, with that, I just want to emphasize on the uh, high performances of LSTM algorithms compared to other models and how they can preserve uh, past information and 
it can improve the forecasting skills. Uh, in addition, the uh, benefits of LSTM is in the way that it uses the memory and how it learns to update the memory and the statistics that we show uh, demonstrate the higher efficiency of LSTM compared to RNN and also uh, the capabilities of deep learning are uh, significantly shown when we have a large amount of data and suitable computational capacity like GPUs. And with that, I'm uh, handing the mic to my colleague, Boshin Pat. Okay, hello everyone. I'm going to talk about short to midterm precision forecast combining numerical weather model and thin convolutional neural network. So the basic of numerical weather prediction is the finding that a particular set of partial differential equations make deterministic description of the atmospheric dynamics as described by its wind speed, uh, density, pressure, temperature, and humidity, and as, as it's shown in this listed equation. So a major job of numerical weather prediction is to first estimate the initial status of the atmosphere, and then secondly, extrapolate the initial estimates by integrating forward these primitive equations or integrate forward their variations. So to realistically model atmospheric dynamics as described in the previous slide is not the uh, it is only a prerequisite for predicting the precipitation process. And this figure shows the prediction scale for sea level pressure and precipitation along the west coast of the United States using two of the GCMs, uh, one is NCF, the other is ECMWF. And we can see that the prediction scale just decreased as forecast lead time extends because of the chaotic effect. But also we see that the sea level pressure has a much higher prediction scale compared to precipitation. This is because Precipitation is not a resolved process. So the key, uh, there are some extra requirements for models to predict precipitation, which are listed as follows. The first one is to predict the onset and strength of the convection if the convection is not resolved by models, which is accounted for, uh, which is accounted by the cloud cumulus parameterization scheme. And the second is to predict the evolution of cloud hydromaterials. So for each kind of hydro material, we would, we would like to introduce an extra different, uh, partial differential equation to describe their e uh, evolution, which is uh, which involves a lot of computation cost and epistemic or aleatory uncertainties. And finally, when we when we get the resulting precipitates, we also need to predict how they fall onto the ground as our as the precipitation we we measure with gauges or some uh, ground-based measurement techniques. So the motivation, uh, uh, when we want to improve the prediction of precipitation, there are two main, uh, there are two main approaches. The first one is to learn from high resolution numerical simulations. And the second one is to learn from observations. Th these two methods consist two of the major directions to really improve the representation of unresolved processes. For example, the paper from Mark Pritchard in UCI, they use cloud resolving model to add a reference to enhance, numer enhance general circulation model capacity in predicting cloud cumulus parameterization. But here we want to focus on learning from observations. So can we leverage the power of deep neural networks to learn from precipitation observations for better precipitation prediction in numerical weather modeling? And let's first frame the problem. So the left one shows the uh, classical Bergen school cyclone model, which is uh, which dates back to maybe the early of the 20th century, we don't have the computation power to, uh, to discretize the primitive equations. So they found that for different uh, evolution stages of a cyclone event, we have, diff we have distinct geopolitical height, we have different pressure fields, and accompanied by these patterns, there are precipitation patterns that, uh, that go through this stage. So, they usually predict precipitation based on reading this kind of synoptic weather chart. But in modern numerical weather prediction, we can actually uh, predict the atmospheric dynamics with a very high accuracy for short to extended range, which is one day up to 10 days. And we can use parameterization schemes to, to estimate the unresolved process of precipitation, basically using the two major parameterization schemes, one is cloud microphysics, and the other is cloud cumulus or convection. 
And if we frame the model, or if we frame the problem like this, it's natural to come up with the with a solution of convolutional neural network. So the uh, in this figure, the left four stage frames show the total column pre flow water geo potential height at different levels with uh within a spatial range of 800 kilometers times 800 kilometers, which is a synoptic scale of an actual tropical cyclone. And the right figure shows the precipitation distribution at the center of this of the 800 kilometer times 800 kilometer region. And with that, we want to say if we can try to extract some local features from uh, uh try to synthesize some local features from the circulation field and gradually merge them into a synoptic feature that promote precipitation. So this is implemented by uh, by introducing the convolutional neural network. So convolutional neural network uses some uh, learnable filters to go through to go through the imager to go through the imagery data and try to synthesize local features from the very previous layer. And by special downscaling, which is achieved by pooling layer, and we can we can merge different local features into a, a larger or synoptic feature. And hopefully by optimizing the parameters within this parametric form, we can see how the synoptic feature from this circulation field promote precipitation. And here is the experiment design. We prepare data from, uh, we, we select predictors from North America regional analysis, and we use CPC gauge based three, uh, uh, daily data as our predictant. And we design this following convolutional neural network. This is a little bit different from conventional convolutional neural network because for every day we have every three hour snapshot of the circulation field. So we map a single convolutional neural network to the, to each each of these eight snapshots of the circulation field, and finally we we just sum them together at the total estimate of the single day's precipitation, and we train we divide the data into training validation and test set. We use cascade gradient descent to train the model using mini batch, and by tuning different learning rates based on empirics, and we adopt an early early stop strategy. And the model is are evaluated using Lumi square error and correlation and compared against the original North America regional real analysis product and the multi-layer perception, which is fully connected neural network, linear regression, k nearest neighbor, and random forest. So here are the results. And uh, we can see uh so we testing the model at 14 grid points here. And uh, if the if the grid point is labeled with red, it means that for all these two Scale matrix, room square error and correlation, uh, room square error and correlation, the CN model outperformed the original North America regional reanalysis product, which is a pretty difficult task because North America regional reanalysis, they have already assimilated gauge based precipitation. But we see that for most of, uh, of the region where synoptic precipitation dominates, our model really just beats the original NAR reanalysis data. And for some of the convective precipitation dominated areas, we are not doing as good, but not so bad. If we say point thirteen is like just from their point sixty nine to their point sixty eight. And we try to compare with our benchmark models of linear regression model, nearest neighbor and random forest. And we notice that this conventional machine learning algorithm they cannot handle uh, high dimensional input data. So we extracted the uh, leading 2, 8, 16, 64, 256 pieces of this circulation field and put, use them as predictors to predict precipitation. And we also use the raw inputs there. And we, it's interesting we notice that nearest neighbor random forest, this should be good, but they cannot compare with linear regression model when the input dimension is really high. For comparison, the original reanalysis, uh, the original reanalysis precipitation product performance is listed in the bottom left and the meta layer perception with the fully connected neural network is this in the middle and the convolutional neural network performance which is the best we achieved in this experiment is listed on the right. So with that we would like to say uh, we are using just the default neural network architecture and we try to say if we very verify this architecture can we achieve better performance or we introduce convolutional neural network here because we introduce the convolution and pooling operation these are infinite strong uh, proud, but do we really need convolution and pooling? And do they need really need to be deep and convolution? 
the the answer is yes. This is uh, this is empirically proved by verifying the model architecture. And we see that if we use a convolution kernel size of five times five, we achieve the best performance here. And this kind of experiments was also conducted by the study this on the right. Do deep convolution nets really need to be deep and convolutional? Usually, if we are dealing with imagery data, the answer is yes. And finally, we try to analyze the model, and we try to visualize the layer activation for two uh, examples. One is a light precision case, and the other is a heavy precision or flat case. And we see that for the input snapshot, which it is down the left, we can't tell a uh, we can't tell a difference based on our limited understanding. But if we see the convolution, uh, the the first uh, output from from the first layer of convolution, we notice that they do show different layer activation map there. And the right hand side shows the perturbation analysis, which monitor how precipitation estimates change with with the dynamics field. So we mon we use a slide, we use a small grid to go through the uh, to go through the input field, and oh, the the this grid is composed of a slight perturbation, and we monitor how precipitation changes with this kind of perturbation. And the result, uh, the interesting thing is that the result shows a like a cyclone feature, which means that the with a further increase of surrounding uh, surrounding pressure and decrease of center pressure, we can achieve higher precipitation estimates, which is in correspondence to our understanding of that. Uh, Cyclone with a with a more intense depression brings more precipitation. And finally, to take away first, Bergen, a Bergen school cyclone model is reframed as a learning image regression problem. So we use CNN to learn precipitation related dynamical features from the surrounding dynamical and moisture field for accurate precipitation estimates. And the other is like a uh, more philosophical, so provided with big data, feature extracted by end-to-end -end learning are already better than those summarized from empirical understanding. <laughs> so for more details, please, please refer to the following two papers. And the second paper, combine convolution and long short term memory for monsoon precipitation prediction, which achieve a, a slight better performance than just using convolutional neural network. So I will give a quick summary here that, um, you know, in this uh, presentation, we mentioned about the precipitation estimation from remote sensing, and then all kind of different uh, network structure, like uh, from traditional to uh, extended to the uh, uh, deep learning network, like uh, STM and CNN that are all used. And the, the results show a lot of opportunities for potential for improved uh, rainfall estimation and also forecasting, uh, uh, especially use uh, the re recent development uh, machine learning the network or the structure. Um, I, like, I would like to thank you for everybody's attention and uh, um, yeah, and open for questions. Okay. All right, Chapang, are you on the line? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Hi. Um, thanks for thanks for the presentation. Um, I have everyone. Please, uh, if you have any questions, please type into the box. I have one question here. Uh, received one question here uh, from Ripal Shah, and um, and he's asking, have you tried applying uh, deep learning, I suppose, to forecast precipitation directly from current temperature observations rather than predicting future temperature? Well, I think that for very short range forecast where we don't have direct observation of the cloud hydro materials, uh, statistical extrapolation is a preferred option, but also improvements in numerical weather uh, prediction data simulation, like they directly assimilate uh, precipitating hydro materials, they can improve numerical weather prediction skills. And for short to extended range, it has been admitted in the in the meteorology uh, community that the only feasible approach is to apply numerical weather prediction. And any statistical extrapolation, it cannot beat the numerical weather prediction. 
And in so it, addition to that, uh, for the direct uh, short-term forecasting of the rainfall, uh, what we can say is that uh, that's possible and people have done it, but the problem with that, with that is it uh, decreases the accuracies because the rainfall itself is Apache uh, in nature. And instead of doing Apache uh, data forecasting, uh, which can be very uh, sparse, uh, for example, imagine two mm -hmm. neighboring pixels, uh, at time t, one of them is not raining, and at t plus one suddenly starts raining heavily. Uh, we try to use a more informative uh, data like cloud top temperature, which is continuous, and we need a robust model to replace a physical uh, equation that is not well described for it, uh, to just do the accurate transfer of uh, heat uh, for the top of the cloud and do the infrared forecasting. And from there, we have a good and accurate model to translate uh, temperature to the rainfall. Okay, so uh, I'd like to go back to what Pasham mentioned earlier. Uh, you said uh, the only possible way of predicting future weather is numerical weather prediction, and you said mm -hmm. no statistical method works. What is one? What, what in the context did you say by that? Do you do you mean by that? Okay, you, there is a there is a meteorology conference from 1950s in Stockholm. They reached this conclusion that. The if you the atmospheric dynamics is deterministically described by the primitive equations, which is a set of partial differential equations. And of course, we see that deep neural network can simulate fluid dynamics like navier stokes equation. But if they want to compete with numerical weather prediction for short to extended range, they must first be able to simulate the structure of this primitive equation, which is like a redundant work. Why don't we just use the established laws to predict the atmospheric dynamics? The reason why we use deep learning here is because the precipitation process is not resolved in this primitive equation. So the, the primitive equation is set of bones of numerical weather prediction. And we need to add flash into it because they are not resolved. And usually we, we rely upon a lot of empirical understandings to implement the cloud microphysics process and the cumulus convection process. But nowadays we see that we can learn from high resolution numerical simulations, or we can just learn from reality, from observations. And our method here is trying to learn directly from observations to just implement the flash of numerical weather prediction. But we always stick, stick to the fact that we should rely on numerical weather prediction to provide the most solid prediction of the weather evolution. It's just like in hydrological modeling, we have the Darcy law, but the Darcy law is not universally approximate, uh, applicable. It's not like a, a atmospheric dynamics where we have the control volume, we have the primitive equation. Mm. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So how 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 did you tune your LSTM uh, hyperparameters from Anish? Uh, uh, Can you repeat the question? How did you how did you tune the hyperparameters? Okay, uh, so it's a back propagation through time. Uh, yes, but I oh, guess the hyperparameters. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so the hyperparameter, the uh, whole model is a three-layer uh, neural network consisting of a LSTM and a fully connected layer at the end. Uh, the hidden layer uh, knows like we have 2,000 uh, memory blocks for the LSTM and uh, the optimizer that we use for it is R RMSD prop, which has been uh, continually reported to be uh, the most efficient optimizer for the rec recurrent neural networks. 
and we uh, fine tune the model from there. Okay. Did I answer your question? Uh, somebody else asked, but I think you you you, you said you use RMS prop, right? Uh, RMS prop, yeah. Okay. Uh, what's that? Like, did you have to do um, multi GPU for that, or no, or 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 no? Uh, well, multi GPU would be nice, but uh, we have some computational limitations, so uh, we use a single GPU for that, and it was efficient for the purpose of our study. Cool. Okay. Uh, I wait a little bit for if there's for additional equa additional questions here. Well, while you're waiting for additional questions, I can talk more about the conference on hydroformatics that we're hosting in the summertime. That's okay. Sure. Yep, let me just take that presenter mode back from you. And I will show my screen. Hopefully it will show. Um, so everyone that's still here, I just wanted to let everyone know, um, I've been mentioning it at every at the end of every webinar, um, Quasi is having um, a conference on hydroinformatics, and this year's theme is Hydroinformatics for Science, Knowledge, and Foreign Policy and Effective Response. It's taking place on July 29th to the 31st in Provo, Utah, on the campus of BYU. Um, Chow Peng is one of the keynote speakers, um, along with several others. We also have eight workshops going on as well um, to take advantage of. And for those of you who are students, um, we do encourage you to submit a poster abstract um, by June 15th. Um, if you submit a poster abstract, you um, have the chance to get a $750 travel grant um, when you present your poster at the conference. So I think that's um, a pretty good deal um, to travel to a conference and get to network with all these people in hydroinformatics. Um, so I would encourage you to submit a poster, and then for everyone else, registration deadline, early bird is June 15th, and regular is July 15th as well. So. Cool. <clears throat> and, and also, uh, you know, while we're waiting for questions, if there are still any, uh, I'd like to say thank you to all the speakers, although may, they may or may not be here right now, we have an excellent forum of speakers that I'm really pleased to have throughout this series and it's an honor to work with you guys and I uh, hope we uh, see you in the future somewhere in the conferences uh, and keep getting the papers in all right well there there doesn't seem to be any more questions uh, and then we would uh, thank Dr. Shu and uh, Baoshan and Atta for a wonderful presentation. Well, thank you to you too, and also you know the organization for providing the opportunity for our uh, information to present to everybody. And thank a lot to you all. Thank you, and and you know th I think this uh, this community really is just uh, starting to form, and this, there are there are many many novel applications. I think either are inspired by these pre preliminary applications or just arising from by themselves from the problems that people are working on. I think it's um, a very in, in new field with uh, lots of opportunities. Uh, so I hope, guys, you can pay attention to some of these conferences as well as the sessions on the AGU um, and online media presence as well as uh, the, the new papers from the, on these journals. So, uh, uh, for example, WRR, Journal of Hydrometeorology, Journal of Hydrology, etc. Uh, there's a lot of new things going on. I'm sure in the next few months we will hear from many different uh, new applications, especially in the modeling domain. So I'm excited to uh, keep monitoring the, the development in the field and we'll try to introduce them to you guys uh, and a new audience through various means. Thanks.
Thanks, Quasi, for giving me this opportunity to host this uh, series. Yeah, no problem. Well, we really appreciate for, this. <laughs> yeah, thanks for your leadership. And uh, I think the community really exciting uh, to go toward this kind of deep learning, machine learning activities. And we look forward, and our students also quite engaged, uh, you know, to the new students in this field. So we look forward to continue to contribute. Awesome. All right, All right well, have a good effort, everyone. Thank you. Talk to, to you later, everyone. See you. Okay.